Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown, and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go. I grew up in the suburbs during the late 1960s, and it was different from today. My parents were pretty laid back compared to most. They let me grow my hair longer than other boys my age. I loved my wavy hair that reached just past my ears and touched my collar. My dad was a musician, and I wanted to be just like him. Most kids in the neighborhood had crew cuts or bowl cuts, but my parents never forced me to conform. Everything was fine until I started first grade in 1970. That's when I had to start taking the bus to school. The walk to the bus stop wasn't far just past a few houses where other kids would gather. On my first day, my mom walked with me to make sure I got on safely. My mom gave me the usual first day reminders, telling me to have a great day and reminding me to be good and listen to the bus driver. I waved goodbye as I climbed aboard, found an empty seat, and settled in for the ride. As soon as we turned the corner and my mom was out of sight, the bus screeched to a halt. The driver got up and started walking down the aisle, glaring at each new student with cold, mean eyes. When he got to me, he stopped. The bus driver mockingly asked what we had here, calling me a little hippie boy in a sneering tone. Before I could respond, he grabbed my hair and yanked me up out of my seat. The pain was shocking as he lifted me by my hair, my feet dangling above the floor. With his other hand, I'll never forget those bony knuckles. He started hitting the side of my head. I screamed and cried until he finally dropped me back into my seat. The bus driver then threatened all of us, warning that anyone who wasn't perfectly still and quiet would get the same treatment he'd just given me. For weeks after that, we rode in terrified silence. I watched helplessly as he did the same thing to other kids for the smallest things, whispering to a friend, dropping a book, or even just fidgeting too much. I never told my parents. Somehow, in my six-year-old mind, I thought this was normal that all bus drivers disciplined kids this way. Then one morning, a new kid got on the bus. He had just moved to our neighborhood, and the driver pounced immediately. The bus driver menacingly announced it was time for the new kid to learn the rules. He grabbed the new kid's hair and started his usual beating. During lunch that day, a group of us surrounded the new kid to warn him. I explained to the new kid that he needed to sit completely still and quiet on the bus or the driver would hurt him again. Another kid chimed in, confirming that the driver did this to everyone who broke his rules. The next morning, the new kid got on and sat quietly, just like we told him. We pulled away from the stop and suddenly police sirens wailed behind us. The bus driver pulled over and this enormous police officer stepped out. He was built like a tank, muscles on top of muscles. He could have probably bent a steel beam with his bare hands. The officer ordered the bus driver to step out and check the front tire, claiming there was something wrong with the lower lug nut. When the bus driver bent down to look, the officer grabbed him by the hair, lifting him clean off the ground with one arm. The sound of his billy club connecting with the driver's body made us all wince, but none of us felt sorry for him. The driver's screams echoed through the bus as the officer kept hitting him. The officer delivered his threat with terrifying clarity, promising to come back and finish what he started if the driver ever touched another child again. The new kid excitedly announced to everyone that the officer was his dad, beaming with pride. We all erupted in cheers as the officer dropped our tormentor to the ground. The bus driver crawled back into his seat, blood dripping from his face and head. He drove us to school in silence, and we never saw him again. Within a week, the school board launched an investigation. Turns out the police officer had gathered statements from several parents whose kids had finally opened up about the abuse. The bus driver was arrested and charged with multiple counts of assault on minors. He ended up serving five years in prison and was banned from ever working with children again. The police officer became a legend in our neighborhood. Every time he drove past our bus stop in his patrol car, we'd wave and cheer. He always smiled and waved back, knowing he had made our lives so much better. That morning changed everything. We could finally ride to school without fear, talk with our friends, and just be kids again. 
I recently got my dream summer job at an outdoor activity center. I've always been into extreme sports, especially surfing. So when they offered me a position teaching people how to use their flow rider, a stationary wave machine, I was thrilled. The pay wasn't amazing, but getting paid to teach surfing, sign me up. After completing my training, I was eager to start teaching. The center usually organizes groups of 9 to 10 people per session since it's more cost effective for customers and gives them more riding time. On what was probably my fourth or fifth time teaching, I had an experience I'll never forget. I was checking the health and safety forms for my upcoming group when I noticed only seven people had signed in. I asked the receptionist if anyone was missing and she mentioned two people were running late. Right on cue, and walks this mom with two kids and a baby. One of the kids, let's call him the troublemaker, was practically bouncing off the walls, clearly on a sugar high from what looked like an entire candy store's worth of chocolate. As I headed to the staff room for a quick drink before the session, the duty manager pulled me aside. He warned me about the group, mentioning they'd been there before. When I asked what happened, he told me to keep an eye on the bigger kid, explaining that during their last visit, he had made a mess of reception, and the mom was difficult. He advised me to keep my radio handy and not hesitate to call him if needed. I started the session with my usual safety briefing but I couldn't even get through the fire safety instructions before the troublemaker interrupted me. He complained that he already knew everything and demanded to know when they could start. I tried to continue explaining about removing jewelry and watches and asking about medical issues or medications. The troublemaker just impatiently asked again if they could go. Finally, I relented and directed them to grab their wetsuits. The session started normally enough. I let the youngest kid turn on the ride, which is a small thing that makes them feel special. The troublemaker immediately whined about not getting to do it, but I ignored him. Things went downhill fast. The troublemaker refused to take turns, so I had to use my tried and true trick of spraying water in his face to get him off the wave. When I tried teaching the group how to jump onto the wave from the back, he wouldn't stop interrupting. I couldn't even finish announcing the next activity before he shouted that he already knew how to do it. He wasn't paying attention when I demonstrated and karma hit quick. When it was his turn, he walked straight into the main flow and landed on his elbow. I had to offer him my hand twice before his pride finally let him accept help. The situation escalated when he started stealing boards from other kids and getting into fights. When I confiscated a board he was using to hit another kid, he actually punched me in the side. I had a bruise there from a cycling accident two days before which worked perfectly in my favor. I radioed his mom over and explained that since her son had punched me, he wouldn't be allowed on for the next 15 minutes. She immediately protested, saying I couldn't do that. I pointed out that if he was stronger or older, it could be considered assault. She tried to downplay it, claiming he hadn't hit me that hard. I showed her the bruise from my bike accident and suggested we could get my manager's opinion on the matter. The session finally ended, but not before more drama. The kid refused to leave the ride and his mom tried to convince me to turn it back on. When I asked why I should, she complained that he hadn't gotten the same amount of time on the ride as others. I told her I would only turn it back on if she paid the 60 pounds to operate the flow rider and convinced my manager it was appropriate. Later, Karen complained to my manager, but the CCTV footage backed up everything I said. After they left, they were caught dropping trash onto people from a railing. The manager called the police and the center permanently banned them from all activities. I found out later that this wasn't their first incident. They had quite a collection of complaints against them. The receptionist told me they were now completely blacklisted, though I joked it would only last until the mom married her next victim. Another customer who witnessed everything tried to tip me five pounds for handling the situation well. When I explained we couldn't accept tips, I directed him to our charity donation box and suggested leaving a review on TripAdvisor instead. A few days later, I got my free lunch reward for receiving another 5-star review. Sometimes, karma works in delicious ways. My sister was always our parents' favorite, the golden child who could do no wrong. While I worked hard through medical school, she floated through life on our parents' dime changing majors three times before settling on fashion design. 
Don't get me wrong, I love my sister. But she always had this way of making everything about herself. When I announced my pregnancy to the family, she somehow turned it into a conversation about her upcoming wedding. When I gave birth to my daughter, she visited the hospital mainly to talk about her wedding dress alterations. The real trouble started three months before her wedding. We were having lunch at our parents' house when she dropped the bomb. She started talking about what would make her wedding absolutely perfect. When I asked if she had finally picked the flowers, she said no. Then she declared that she wanted my daughter to be her wedding gift. I thought she was joking at first, but she was dead serious. She tried to convince me by pointing out how busy I always was at the hospital while she had plenty of free time. She added that she didn't want to go through pregnancy and childbirth because it would ruin her figure, but still wanted the experience of being a mom. In her mind, this made it the perfect solution. When I told her she couldn't be serious and that my daughter wasn't a handbag she could just borrow, she accused me of being selfish. She started listing all the things she could give my daughter, like trips to Paris Fashion Week and fancy clothes. Then our mother made it worse by suggesting I should consider my sister's offer, reminding me how good she supposedly was with children. I got up and left, but that was just the beginning. For the next few weeks, she bombarded me with texts and calls. Our parents kept trying to convince me to at least think about it. My sister even showed up at my workplace once, causing a scene in the hospital lobby about how I was ruining her perfect wedding. I still went to her wedding, stupid me trying to keep the peace. My husband stayed home with our daughter since we didn't trust the situation. The ceremony went fine, but during the reception, I got a panicked call from my husband telling me our daughter was gone. Someone had broken into the house and taken her. I immediately knew. I ran to find my sister, but she wasn't at her own reception. That's when one of her bridesmaids approached me, looking nervous. She revealed that my sister had hired someone to take my daughter, claiming it was all arranged with me and part of some surprise. I called the police immediately. They found my sister at a hotel just outside of town with our daughter. She was still in her wedding dress trying to book a flight to France. Turns out she had been planning this for weeks. She had hired a private investigator to learn our routines and found someone willing to break into our house, all paid for with our parents' credit cards. The trial was a wake-up call for everyone. My sister broke down on the stand, ranting about how she deserved to be a mother more than me because she could provide a more sophisticated upbringing. The judge wasn't impressed. She got eight years for conspiracy to commit kidnapping. Our parents finally saw her for who she really was. They tried to apologize to me, but the damage was done. I haven't spoken to them since the trial. They still visit my sister in prison, sending her care packages and money for the commissary. Last I heard, they're trying to get her sentence reduced. My daughter is five now, happy and healthy. Sometimes she asks about her aunt, and I tell her the truth in age-appropriate ways. My husband and I moved to another state, started fresh. I still practice medicine, but now I specialize in trauma counseling for families. Turns out my sister did end up changing my life just not in the way she planned. The funny thing is, she still doesn't think she did anything wrong. She sends letters from prison sometimes, still trying to justify herself. In her letters, she writes about how she would have given my daughter everything and calls me selfish for keeping her away. I don't reply anymore. Some people never change. They just get better at hiding their entitlement until they don't. I own a small bakery that specializes in custom birthday cakes. Been doing this for about six years now, and I've built quite a reputation in our community. My sister asked me to make a special cake for my niece's seventh birthday, a three-tiered masterpiece with handcrafted sugar flowers and a princess castle theme. It took me three days to perfect it, but seeing my niece's face would be worth every minute. My sister booked the crystal room at the Grand Plaza Hotel. It's this beautiful space with floor-to-ceiling windows and a connecting door to a smaller conference room. The hotel confirmed her booking two months in advance, and she went all out with decorations, hired entertainers, the works. On the day of the party, I arrived early to set up the cake. That's when I first encountered him. This guy in an expensive suit storming through the hotel lobby, 
shouting into his phone. The hotel manager was trailing behind him, trying to explain something, but this guy wasn't having it. The CEO started yelling at the hotel manager, demanding to know why there was a children's party next door. He kept insisting that he had specifically requested the entire wing for his board meeting and then pulled the classic, do you know who I am, line. The hotel manager tried to calmly explain that the crystal room and conference room B were separate spaces and attempted to point out that the birthday party had been booked months ago, but the CEO cut him off mid-sentence. The CEO then started ranting about how he didn't care when it was booked, arguing that he was paying premium rates and wouldn't tolerate his meeting being disrupted by screaming children. The hotel manager tried to explain that the spaces were soundproofed, but the CEO demanded they move my niece's party to the parking lot. My sister came in during this argument and told him that they weren't moving anywhere, explaining that they had paid for the space and her daughter's guests would be arriving soon. The CEO responded by insulting her, saying he had a multi-million dollar deal on the line and referred to my niece as a little brat, suggesting her party could happen anywhere. That's when I stepped in trying to mediate by suggesting we could work something out, mentioning the soundproofing again. But the CEO just shouted at me to shut up, declaring he'd had enough of this nonsense. He stormed into our room straight towards the cake table. Everything happened so fast. He raised his foot and kicked the bottom tier of my masterpiece. The whole thing collapsed, splattering across the floor. My niece, who had just walked in with my brother-in-law, burst into tears. The CEO stood there with this smug look on his face, but it didn't last long. My brother-in-law, who happens to be a former college football player, tackled him to the ground so fast, it was almost beautiful to watch. The CEO's face planted right into some of the scattered cake frosting. The CEO started screaming from under my brother-in-law, demanding to be released and threatening to sue us all. My brother-in-law just calmly told him he could sue us from jail. The hotel security arrived within minutes, followed by the police. Turns out the CEO had quite a reputation for throwing tantrums like this. The hotel's cameras caught everything, and several guests had their phones out recording the whole scene. One of the board members he was meeting with witnessed the whole thing. She came over while the police were handcuffing him and apologized for his behavior. She revealed that the board had been looking for a reason to remove him, and this public meltdown was exactly what they needed. She told us they would be pressing charges for damage to hotel property and encouraged us to do the same. The hotel comped us their grand ballroom for the party and their executive chef whipped up an emergency cake. It wasn't as elaborate as mine, but my niece ended up having an even better time because now her party had a real princess ballroom. The CEO was charged with vandalism, disorderly conduct and assault. He shoved the hotel manager during his initial tantrum. His company's board fired him the next day, and the video of his meltdown went viral. My bakery got tons of publicity from the incident, and I now have a waiting list months long. His former company now orders all their corporate event cakes from my bakery. Their new CEO makes sure to personally approve each order with a note apologizing for her predecessor's behavior. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching and see you next time.